Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of How to Live to 200. I'm T.A. McCann, serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and advocate of the quantified self. Today, I'm joined by Richard Sprague. Richard has been a technology executive and entrepreneur for decades. Lately, he's been digging in deep to the science of the microbiome and is working on building a community to share insights and collect data around this very subject. The gut microbiome is an emerging area of human health and longevity. If you've heard about eating yogurt with probiotics, or you've been told you should drink kombucha because it's healthy for you, this has to do with the gut microbiome. But it's a bit more complicated than that. Each person literally has trillions of bacteria in their gut. Which bacteria and how many there are can influence your health? This is what testing the microbiome is all about and what Richard's going to explain today. If you're interested in how the bacteria in your gut can affect your health, everything from weight to schizophrenia, you'll want to listen. Richard is a character, one who plays a recording on his phone. Okay. If you're interested in, in how the back if you're interested in how the bacteria all right, now I got distracted because you because you're making it pink. No, I'm just watching. I'm watching your edit. If you're interested in how bacteria, if you're interested in how the bacteria in your gut can affect your health, everything from your weight to schizophrenia, you'll want to listen. Richard is definitely a character and at one point plays a recording on his phone. He actually collected his microbiome and turned it into what I might call music. You'll have to hear it for yourself. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I think you will too. And now, this is how to live to 200. So welcome, Richard, to the How to Live to 200 podcast. <laughs> Thank you. It's a real honor. So I noticed in your bio that you were a citizen scientist for Ubiome at one point in time. What does that mm -hmm. mean? That's actually kind of funny because um, I've been interested in, uh, like I consider myself to be a, a computer person. I've been interested in software and software engineering forever. But um, if you're really interested in software, at some point you start becoming interested in hardware. And I was also interested in uh, like my own health and my own well-being and that sort of thing. And and a lot of that is about software, you know, like what do you think, what do you eat, the, you know, what's your attitude about life? But when you start thinking a little bit more deeply, you start wondering, like, what's the human hardware in you? What is that? And, of course, that comes down to genes. And uh, so I started studying um, genes right around the time that the Human Genome Project came out, around year 2000. And... Uh, and I tried a few things, like I tried the 23andMe test and um, um, a couple other like genetic tests like for ancestry and, and all those sorts of things. And I found out that uh, it doesn't really tell you all that much that's super actionable. It will tell you that you should eat more fruits and vegetables. It might tell you that your eyes are blue. It might tell you those sorts of things. But it doesn't really tell you a lot about how can I improve my athletic performance or what can I do to have better digestion or how do you lose weight or those kinds of things. And um, so I kind of put that on the side. And then I, I noticed this one um, Kickstarter project, which is from Indiegogo, from a, a couple of graduate students at UCSF who were um, offering to se uh, sequence your human microbiome. And so I thought, like, huh, that's funny. And so I looked into it and I found out that we actually have way, way more genetic material in our bodies, in and on our bodies, um, from microbes than we have from human DNA. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. In fact, it ends up being, it's something like an order of magnitude more DNA that's in and on you right now is from microbes than from your human cells. And those microbes have all co-evolved with humans and they're doing stuff. And they have something, they, have, they apparently have association with just about any kind of condition you can think of, whether it's you know, allergies or asthma or um, even things like, um, so li like, for example, Lyme disease, we know that that's caused by microbe. Even behavioral issues like schizophrenia, you know, depression, lots of things have been associated with the human microbiome. And anyway, so I was very interested in that. So I thought, you know what, I'll get myself tested. And uh, it was like 99 bucks or something like that. And so a few months later, I got my results back. And what was really cool about the results was that they also shipped the raw data. So I was able to go and look in there programmatically and just kind of study the raw data a little bit. And I got sort of really into it. And so I ended up talking to the, um, the people who... Um, who run you by them. The, again, like I said, it was a, it was a graduate student. 
And uh, I was really obsessed because I was one of these people who was um, doing a lot of tests on myself, plus also a lot of the other people, as word got out that I was doing this, were, would be sending my results. And um, I started talking to them about some of their limitations in terms of the, the product and ways that I wish that they could go as a company. And long story short, they said, well, why don't you just come on board and um, we'll try to come up with some kind of fancy title for you. But for now, why don't you just call yourself a citizen scientist in residence? <laughs> and and it so get, it's great. And over that period of time, how many different tests have you done on yourself? <laughs> I have done, I think my latest number is something like 600 something. Yeah. Um, so several hundred. <laughs> and, and, for, uh, and, and for people who don't know, how does one test their gut well, microbiome? Okay, so there are... Um, so the microbiome is a lot of things. It means um, the you know you've got microbes on your skin, you've got them in your mouth, you've got them in your ears, you've got them all over the place. When people talk about the microbiome, most of the time they talk about your gut microbiome, which is the microbes that are inside of your intestines. And the way you get to that is by going to the toilet and you get a little swab of this. Um, it's a little polyester swab. And um, you just wipe it on the toilet paper and... Um, the cool thing about genetic sequencing is that just a microscopic amount is enough to be able to get the DNA off of it, and then they sequence that. So it's sort of like a Q-tip or something like yep. that, that mm -hmm. then you send that in. Yep. And then what does a report look like? Well, okay, so the report, when you're talking about human DNA, I think there are something like 3 billion um, uh, DNA letters, what are called bases, in, a human, you know, in human DNA. To sequence that took the Human Genome Project, you know, billions of dollars in a long time. When you're talking about um, sequencing the microbes inside of you, there are thousands, probably tens of thousands of different unique species, all of them which are as different from one another as you are from a corn plant. Just extremely, um, you know, huge variety of life that's in there. To sequence every single one of them would be like trying to do the Human Genome Project a gazillion times over. And the data that you'd get back would just be enormous. What scientists have discovered is this very cool trick that um, amounts to, they sequence one part of the bacterial gene, something a, a gene that's only found in bacteria, it's called the 16S portion. And they, um, because they've already done the work of sequencing a lot of the microbes that are already inside the gut, and they did it the hard way, just by looking at that one 16S sequence, which is about 200 base pairs long, they're able to look it up in a database of all the other bacteria and then kind of guess which microbe it actually is. And it's a pretty good guess. And so they're able to find out like something like 90% of all the microbes. They're able to identify it by species name um, just based on that one little marker. So the data that I get back in my reports and the ones that I, I throw into my, um, my software for analysis gives me a list of, usually it's a couple hundred of the main phylum of the, or I'm sorry, of the, of the main species that you get in there. And uh, it'll say, what percentage of my gut microbiome is made up of those species. So I'll get back something that says, for example, it might say that um, bifidobacterium, which is a common microbe that you see in probiotics, for example, um, it might say that that was 3% of my microbiome. And then it'll come back and say something else is you know, 2% or 0.1%. And, um, and then what you'll do is, uh, after you get that, you, know, you get what I find interesting is you get one result like that, and... Uh, the next day or a week later or something, you do another test and you get, a, you get another result and you'll find that the, the, the numbers have changed, obviously. Um, but by looking at the way it's changed, you can start to see patterns in the microbiome. Um, and that's how I go about trying to figure out what the meaning is behind it. So you've done about 600 tests on yourself yeah. over how long a period of time? Um, well, this uh, Indiegogo campaign started, I think, in 2014. Um, and I was one of the first ones. So... Um, uh, it hasn't been daily since 2014. I was doing it um, mostly daily in 2016 and 17, uh, and then you know weekly or so um, before that. And what do you really feel like you've learned? <laughs> so that's a good other question. Than how, other than how to take samples. That's a good question, yeah. So um, at a high level, one of the things that I've learned is that the human microbiome is it's variable. Every day you get a different result, and it's a significantly different result. So one of the things that I tell people who are doing microbiome testing is don't read a whole lot into a single result because um, you'll get something back. But if you test it yourself the next day, you might get something back that's you know, pretty different. Um, uh, so that's the first thing I learned. There's a lot of variability. Um, the very first time I got a test back, I was like, wow, this is cool. This is my microbiome. And I was treating it the same way that I would treat like a genetic test result. And that's just not true. So that was the first thing I learned. 
Um, the second thing I learned is that despite the fact that there is a lot of variability, there are also some patterns. And so, for example, um, I find that in, inside of me, I've got a couple of microbes that are, um, that are unique and somehow seem to be important. Um, so, for example, I mentioned bifidobacterium a second ago about um, the probiotic bacteria. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, um, when I see somebody who has um, no bifidobacterium, uh, I'll find out that they have some other kinds of um, issues, usually related to sleep or to um, like um, depression, things like that, because uh, it is known that the bifidobacterium microbe um, is producing some of the precursors to things like serotonin and melatonin. So um, I'm able to find those sorts of things, and, I'm, and, I, and I'll often run into somebody who's missing, for example, bifidobacterium, and I'll say, hey, so uh, are you by any chance having any problems sleeping? And, and the vast majority of time they'll say, yeah, that's true. I just always have a hard time sleeping. So there are little things like that that I noticed. But the other thing that I've noticed is um, that it was, I was very excited about when I found this. Um, I'd seen a study a few years ago, and you might have heard it on like NPR or something, about um, somebody was comparing the guts of Japanese people and American people and found out that uh, Japanese people have this one particular kind of microbe that uh, it turns out is very good at digesting seaweed. So it's, it's part of their digestive system. They're able to digest seaweed in a way that um, the study found that they studied a bunch of North Americans and found that none of them had this microbe. So Japanese people are di able to digest seaweed that, that North Americans can't. And I looked at my test results and I found out that despite what that study said, I have that same microbe. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought that was pretty cool because I, um, in my past life, had lived in Japan for about 10 years. And so it looks like somehow I was able to pick up that microbe. It struck me then that unlike in the case of my human DNA, where whatever eye color I get, whatever predisposition I get to Parkinson's disease, all these kind of things, with the human microbiome, I can change my microbes. <laughs> So just like I was able to, apparently by living in Japan for a long time, pick up this other microbe that lets me digest seaweed, maybe I can pick up lots of other microbes that would let me do the same thing. You know, I consider myself a healthy person. I've been an athlete. I've been a pescatarian or basically a vegetarian for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And yet when I did my microbiome test and I sent it to you, what did we find and what did you say about it? Yeah, um, yeah, so you're kind of interesting. Um, uh, first of all, you had no none of the the so-called the so probiotic bacteria. So you had none of the bifidobacterium or lactobacillus, which everybody considers to be good for health. And um, like I was telling, I mean, like I, was, I said about bifidobacterium, I almost never see people who have zero bifido um, who uh, are able to sleep well. Do you ever do you ever have sleep problems? I don't. In fact, people laugh about that I'm particularly <laughs> good at sleeping. Okay. Um, how about um, depression or anxiety or at least not like today? That? Okay, <laughs> all right, yeah. So, so yeah, that's really odd. Um, I think I you told I think you told me that I have the microbiome of a sick person. Yeah, it, I mean that's what it looks like to me. Now, um, uh, you've been a vegetarian for your your whole life, or how long have you been? Most a of my adult life, okay, so 20, okay. 25 Would years. Would you say that uh, as a child you were unusually sick or anything special about you as a child? No. No? Okay. Huh. What about antibiotics? Did you use that a lot? I had a lot of allergies as a kid. Okay. Uh, I have a little bit of uh, uh, breathing problem, so maybe, but okay. I would you, say nothing. Did you take a lot of um, like allergy, I guess, antibiotics or anything like that as, as a result of allergies? Or I don't know if anything that were specifically more or less. Yeah, I don't recall that. Do you still have allergies right now? Not as much. Okay. Actually, when I stopped eating meat and I moved to California at the same time, uh -huh. most of my allergies went away. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's interesting. That was a long time ago. Yeah. That was mm -hmm. basically 1990. So okay. a long time ago. But I do know, I mentioned a correlation. So I grew up in the Midwest as well. Mm -hmm. And in that Midwest, I had allergies constantly uh, as a kid yeah, and through my college years. And then when I moved to California, I gave up meat. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, those went away for the most part. Interesting. Did you grow up in a like an urban environment, or were you exposed to farms at all? Or um... I, I wasn't normally a farming. I grew up near Lake Michigan, okay. outside Chicago. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. more more okay. of a beach than okay. a farm. So so there. I mean, there are a couple possibilities. Um, the most likely possibility is just science doesn't know yet, <laughs> and so you're totally healthy and everything's fine. Uh, uh, the second most likely possibility is that you need to test again. That maybe for whatever reason we just got you on a bad day and we only grabbed the part of your microbiome that didn't include those things. Um, but the other possibility is that um, I noticed that, for example, you have a high amount of the highest I've ever seen of this microbe called Blaudia. And not a whole lot is known about Blaudia. 
and it's just a little bit odd that you have so much of it. And I don't, I don't know that it's associated with your diet or your lifestyle or something like that. Um, but that would be something I would look into more and see if maybe that's what's keeping you healthy. Um, if that were the case, and if we found out that, for example, it was the bloody or some other combination of other microbes that were the things that were keeping you healthy, that's something you'd want to watch because um, it is true that the vast majority of people who have the you know none of the good bacteria, like the vast majority of people look like you, have some kind of problem. So um, if you, for whatever reason, lost those things that make you unique, um, you might you might run into trouble. What would somebody who did a test like this and found the issues relating to their sleep? What might they do to improve, change? So do okay, that's a testing? super good question, and I've been I've been looking into that a lot. Um, and obviously, like I run into a lot of people who have this problem, and I'm I'm trying to figure out how to solve it. Um, obviously, you think well, if there is a connection between missing bifidobacterium and and um, you know these other uh, you know hormones like melatonin and serotonin that are involved in the in sleep then you'd want to figure out well what can i do to get more bifidobacterium and bifido is a very well studied bacterium so it's it's pretty well understood it's um like what it eats and you know what kind of environment it likes to live in and one of the things that it likes to eat is a particular type of starch it's um called resistant starch 2 and uh so um one of the tricks that um that that you can try is if you want to feed more of your bifidobacterium, is take some of that resistant starch too and just eat it. And um, uh, so you're, you're familiar with Bob's Red Mill potato starch. Have yes, you ever seen Bob's yes. Red mm-hmm. Mill? Like in mm-hmm. a, you go to any supermarket and you find it. Go buy a, like two or three dollar package of Bob's Red Mill potato starch. Most people use it for cooking. If you just um, like about twelve hours before you would like to be in a deep sleep. Mix it up some with some like water or orange juice or something like that, and just drink it. Drink like a like a a couple teaspoons, maybe a tablespoon, not too much. What will happen is that that potato starch, it can't be digested by your human digestive system, so it'll go into your stomach and end up in your in your gut, and there, your bifidobacterium will go crazy, because <laughs> it's like feeding time. <laughs> and um, I've tested this on myself, and I'm able to show how the. Um, my bifidobacterium will be at a particular level, and then I start eating the potato starch, and you just see this bloom, just a ton of bifidobacterium in there. Um, and so that's, that's my advice to people who are having some troubles with sleep that can be traced to a lack of um, no bifido. Um, now, the question you might ask is, what happens if I have no bifidobacterium? And um, that's a problem that I haven't been able to solve. I don't know what you do, because this bloom only works if you've got something to feed. So if you're in a situation where there are no bifidobacterium in the first place, I don't know how you fix that. Um, is there a hypothesis that this FMT type approach will actually solve some of that? And maybe you can explain for everyone what FMT means, what's happening, where it's happening, and where it may be applied. Yeah, so FMT is interesting. Um, fecal uh, microbiome transplant um, is a way that you can take an entire microbial system and put it into your gut all at one time. Because one of the problems is if you try to just put in one microbe at a time, um, it may or may not take. And in the case of bifido, you know, that's, that's apparently what the problem is. If you just take a probiotic pill, it may not just, it just probably won't do any good. So what people will do is um, you find somebody else who's got a very good microbiome, the kind of microbiome that you'd like to have, and it has plenty of bifido or it has plenty of whatever else you want. And you get them to excrete a sample and um, you take that sample and you put it into a turkey baster, and there you go. You can put that into your own microbiome. And, is and this, people do that. Is it, this is working. Where, um, where, where might this work? And- okay, so the FDA has approved it. It's an actual treatment for um, C. difficile um, infections. And it's incredible how well it works because until this treatment came available, if you came down with a C. difficile, um, it's a type of, um, you know, it's a nasty, nasty infection. It was almost like a death sentence. You would be stuck with this terrible, terrible infection for, you know, a lot of people would have would debilitating stomach pains and all kinds of other digestive issues for years and years and years, and you can't get rid of it. And you could blast yourself with as many antibiotics as you want, and it just wouldn't go away. Well, um, somebody discovered, a little bit by accident, that um, if you flush the person's gut, and then you take this turkey baster thing, and you give them some um, a, a full working... Uh, microbiome from somebody else um, that suddenly the whole thing just um, tra- you know it will transplant itself and now you've got a full working microbiome and 
people recover from C. difficile infections within hours. It's just fantastic. Now, in the course of doing that, um, so people have tried this on, um, you know, C. difficile, it works very well. And as I said, it's, the, it's FDA approved for that. People have tried that with, with and everything besides um, C. difficile is kind of more mixed, um, mixed, mixed success. There have been a couple of anecdotal things, like um, somebody will have a C. difficile infection and they'll do a, an FMT with somebody who is obese. And it's a skinny person to begin with, but when they do the FMT, they find out that the C. difficile infection is gone, but now they're obese. <laughs> Or um, the C. difficile infection is gone, but now they're depressed all the time, or vice versa. So people have taken that and thought, well, gee, if, um, if this does work, sometimes maybe I'll try it up on my own. And you can go find on the internet lots of people who are doing this, you know, it's DIY, where um, you go get a friend and you do this, and, um, um, you know, with mixed results. I think it's super dangerous because you're transplanting a full microbiome from somebody that you know, and it, it's a microbiome that works for somebody else. It may not work for you. <laughs> so Richard, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the relationship to the, of the microbiome to other kinds of behavioral issues. Yeah. Okay. So behavior is a really interesting one. Um, have you ever heard of, uh, there's a microbe called Toxoplasma gondii. Have you heard of that? Don't ask me to pronounce it. No, I have not heard of it. <laughs> yeah, so so um, this was a fascinating experiment that was done, I don't like, um, I, 10 years ago or something at Stanford where they, they take, um, uh, there's a, a microbe that naturally uh, um, like reproduces inside the guts of cats. And uh, so you've heard, like, for example, that pregnant women should stay away from cat litter. Have you ever heard that? I have heard so, like, that. That's, and, and people say that, um, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things related to cats and pregnant women that, you know, there are all these superstitions around. Well, it's believed that the reason for that is because Toxoplasma gondii can um, only reproduce inside the gut of cats. But it turns out that part of its life cycle is to get caught into the gut of a mouse. So if it can find its way into a mouse um, somehow, it will, um, and they've got images on this. You can go look online, you can see the images of the brain scans of the mice, where the Toxoplasma gondii microbe finds its way into the brain of the mouse. And then it kind of just sits there. The mouse, as a result of having this microbe in it, suddenly becomes unnaturally attracted to cat urine. <laughs> So isn't that weird? So like these guys, suddenly the, the mouse wants to find more cat urine, not like rabbit urine. They've, they've tested this, like human urine, nope. You know, other kinds of urine, nope, just cat urine. What do you think is gonna happen to a mouse that is unnaturally attracted to cat urine? Not a good ending. No, it's gonna end up inside of a cat. And guess what? That's exactly where the microbe wants to be, inside of a cat gut, so that it can reproduce. All right, so, so bring me back now to so, humans and their behavioral exactly. issues. So what's interesting is that somehow or another, this microbe found its way into, into the brain of a mouse and, able, and is able to change the behavior of the mouse. What kinds of other microbes are sitting inside of you right now changing your behavior in order to make you do things? And these are things that you think you're doing because you're doing it. Maybe a microbe is telling you to do that. Um, look at Zika, for example. Um, what does Zika do? Zika causes this terrible type of a brain disorder in infant babies. But it causes that disorder because we can tell. How do you know that there aren't another zillion other microbes that made it into the brains of you as a baby? And you can't tell because all it did is make you more, um, I don't know, you're more uh, um, predisposed to try risky things because it's a microbe that likes to find its way into something that involves risk. Um, there are all kinds of examples like this. Um, uh, you know, there are clear associations, say, for example, um, why is it that... Uh, People who vote Republican um, tend to gather together. Like, is there some kind of contagion that happens? Maybe a lot of your political beliefs, or maybe a lot of the other beliefs that you have are actually things that are caused by some microbe that for whatever reason wants you to be near other people like you. Um, uh, like say OCD. And then um, you can do FMT around to, to, to go I to a different political work. party. I bet it would work. How much you want to bet it would work? And I bet that in fact, there probably are people who are doing FMTs today who suddenly find themselves in a different political like a different, party. Yeah, like thinking to themselves, you know what, maybe I really don't belong in these, with these guys anymore. That could totally happen. We should try that. Um, look at, like, OCD is another example of um, obsessive compulsive disorder. People with OCD, what do they like to do? They like to wash their hands. Why do they want to wash their hands? Because some microbe doesn't like competition. So it somehow is infecting the brain to make it so the brain thinks, get rid of other microbes. I want to have this body all to myself. And I think if you go down the list, you're going to find out a whole bunch of other things like that. Um, Similarly, with uh, other conditions that we think today are clearly either genetic or environmental or whatever, 
take like heart disease or cancer, all of these things have been shown their associations with the microbiome. And, um, and I believe that in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years, we're gonna find out that most things, most conditions are actually infections. So on one end of the spectrum, we have just get some potato starch. And on the other end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. we have full DIY FMT. Yep. Now, I, I should say also a thing. Um, so we're talking about the gut microbiome, which is very interesting. And that's kind of what most people, what's, that's what most people think. And the vast majority of your microbes are from the gut. But there are lots of other microbiomes as well. So um, your skin microbiome, um, is a, that's a much easier one to test. You just take the same Q-tip and uh, you swab it against your skin. And you can find lots of interesting things there as well. We know that acne, for example, is, you know, is, it's clearly it's caused by a microbe. Same thing goes with eczema and lots and lots of other skin conditions. The reason why uh, you have you know, underarm odor is because of a particular microbe. It's called corneobacterium, and that's the one that produces an odor. All of these things are caused by microbes. And there have been various different attempts to try to manipulate that. So there's a company that will actually sell you a spray that um, will uh, try to repopulate a uh, a, a particular microbe that people think is really important for skin. Um, we were talking about FMTs. Well, there's also the possibility, and this might be a little bit less gross for people, is you might be able to transplant the the skin microbiome of somebody, um, which might be, you know, that might be a good thing. So, for example, somebody who's got particularly bad odor, <laughs> for example, you might, there might be a way for you to be able to transplant the, um, the microbial community from somebody who doesn't have bad odor <laughs> and fix it that way. Same thing goes with um, uh, the mouth because we know that the mouth is, uh, um, the microbes in your mouth, that's what causes cavities. There's a particular well-studied microbe that is the one that transplants itself into a biofilm and it gets on your tooth and it will eat sugar and it will drill holes in your enamel. Well, if you, um, if you don't have that microbe, uh, you might be able to get away with never brushing your teeth and you'll have no problems at all. If you do have that microbe, you can brush your teeth all you want. It's not going to help because that microbe's in there. And um, uh, so if there's, and, and so there again, there might be a way to be able to transplant the microbes from somebody else that would fix um, your cavity problems better than other kinds of remedies. Let's talk about a few other conditions which are well known that have a high correlation, especially to the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. Um, and we might mention some of the work you've been doing with Ken. Yeah, in those, yeah, uh-huh, in those yeah, particular yeah. areas. So maybe you could tell us first of a little yeah, bit about, about Ken. Ken. Ken Lassison is a really cool guy. He's, um, he lives in uh, not too far from Seattle. And uh, um, he's an older guy. He, was, um, he worked at uh, like a lot of different high-tech companies in his career. And, and uh, I think the way he tells his story is that about, is it 10 or 15 years ago, um, he was minding his own business. He was a little stressed out at work. There was you know some idiot boss or something that was um, getting him down. And he became extremely tired, just unbelievably tired, beyond any kind of um, fatigue that he's ever felt before. And it turned out that uh, he was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a serious problem for a lot of people. And um, it's difficult to diagnose and treat. And a lot of people who have CFS will go to the doctor and find out, the doctor is like, well, you know, you just need to get more rest or, you know what? You know, you know, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. You know, just, just lighten up a little bit. You'll be fine. Or, you know, worse, maybe the doctor will say, here, take these, you know, opioids or whatever, and this will fix it. And nothing seems to work. And so um, he started this, um, this blog, um, a website, cfsremission.com, where he wrote about his own story. And then he started getting lots and lots of people writing to him about various different ways that they were dealing with CFS. Um, he actually recovered, and he recovered through, you know, for, through a, different, uh, a couple of different things that he mentioned in his blog. But along the way, um, he and some of his readers discovered that there was this very strong association with the microbiome. And um, this is about the time that tests like uh, the Ubiome test came out. So it's, you know, it's reasonably, um, you know, uh, like 100 bucks or something like you can test your microbiome. And a ton of people started sending him their data about their microbiomes. And people have started analyzing this. And Ken is this crazy guy when it comes to being um, very obsessed and uh, um, just he's just really into this stuff. And so for years now, he has spent his weekends looking at the scientific literature, digging deeply into all the microbes of the people that you know, have sent him their, their data, 
looking at all the scientific references you can find about what causes those microbes to go up or down, um, you know, other kinds of associations they have, all mostly in the context of CFS. But now he's got this awesome database where um, if there's a particular microbe that you're interested in uh, and you want to have more or less of it, he's got this list of things that you can do for each one. It's very cool. And tell me then, a lot of people have sent you their samples as well, Mm -hmm. right? As you've sort of worked uh, to understand yourself Mm -hmm. and interpret this data. So tell us how you've sort of a, analyze that, characterize that, and you've also worked on quite a long publication yourself. Yeah, yeah. So um, for many years, partly as a result of just, um, you know, I've posted a lot of the microbiome things that I've learned on the internet. A lot of people read what I write, and they'll just send me an email saying, you know, what do you think about my microbiome results? And as a result, just, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people have sent me their data. I... Um, over the years, I've written a number of different um, uh, like analysis scripts in uh, both Python and R that let me do some pretty sophisticated analysis, like to go look at, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's important to be able to compare one, micro, one microbiome with another. You can learn a lot by telling like what changed between, you know, between trying this particular remedy or not. Or if you've got two different people, one is healthy, one's not healthy, to be able to compare them. So I wrote all this, um, I wrote all this software with that. And, uh, and I started working on two things. One is I started writing down all of the different things that, um, that I was learning for myself, both from my you know, hundreds and hundreds of tests on myself, but also from the various different things that people have sent me. And I put that all in this ginormous little guide that I call the Personal Science Guide to the Microbiome. And at this point, it's you know, three, 400 pages of all of my results and what I've learned and the references that I've had and everything else. But that still was kind of limiting because um, somebody could read that and, uh, you know, they might learn something, but what you really care about is yourself. <laughs> you know, like you get your own microbiome results and, and, uh, and I've got these pretty pictures that will show, for example, how two microbiomes are different. Or um, this one example that I can show you is of babies. Like you've got seven or eight babies all lined up. Their microbiomes are all lined up and, you know, all babies cry. How does the parent know if this baby has a serious issue or not? Well, you know, it might be related to the microbiome. And so by looking at this graphically, you're, you're able to see, well, oh, obviously this baby is very different from the other babies. And so I've got a whole bunch of examples like that. And I said, um, you know, people are sending me this data over, you know, just email. And then I have to go through the effort of uploading it to my software and doing all this other kind of work. So I said, I said you know what, maybe we'll get together with, with a, you know, got together with a couple of friends. We said, we'll make a website. They'll do this. And so the website is personalscience.com where you can go and upload your data and um, compare it to other people. And um, we're hoping that as a result, I won't be the bottleneck anymore of this sorts of analysis, that people will be able to talk to one another and try to understand more things about each other. And um, in that way, we'll all learn more together about what all these microbes are doing. Tell us a little bit more about personal science. How does it work? How might somebody use it? What might they see? And we'll include some of these sort of visuals in the show notes and certainly sure. a link to the site. Yeah. But. yeah. So let me talk a little bit about, um, uh, about what, I, what I call personal science in the first place. Um, when normal people, um, you run into some kind of a health issue or any kind of a, like you're trying to improve yourself as an athlete to be uh, like more performant, et cetera. We'd all like to take a little bit more of a quantitative approach. So you hear what somebody told you um, about, you know, try this pill or, you know, try that method or something like that. But there's no place right now for you to be able to test that out really more rigorously for yourself and compare yourself to other people. Now, scientists get to do this all the time. So professional scientists, uh, you know, they'll go um, get a NIH grant from someplace and they'll recruit 100 volunteers and they'll divide them into, you know, 50 of this and 50 of that. And then they'll take six years and they'll do some kind of a major test and then they'll publish it and um, and they'll be able to say, yes, this works, or no, it doesn't, or you know, something in between. Well, that's professional science. What I think there's room for is something we call personal science, where you're able to do the same kind of method, only do it in a way that helps yourself and is using the data that's around you and around your friends. And so we've tried to build a site that you can go upload your, um, we're starting with the microbiome, so you upload your microbiome data, and it's a very simple process. Once you do that, then um, now you're able to apply the same kind of techniques that a normal scientist would apply to that data. So uh, you maybe tag it with certain types of uh, metadata. You say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a male, I'm this age, I'm, I'm healthy or I'm suffering from this condition or whatever. And 
then you can compare that to all the other data that people have uploaded to the site. So you might want to compare your sample with, for example, other people who have um, reported to have Lyme disease. And you'll be able to see, well, interestingly, here's the difference between my microbiome, which is healthy, and the people with Lyme disease, or vice versa. And we're hoping that by being able to do that, by creating this platform so that people can be personal scientists, we'll be able to uncover lots of new hypotheses that were much harder to uncover and were limited basically to professional scientists in the past. And can you tell me a little bit about the the next action? So somebody's seeing their comparison, and I think you've mentioned the take and avoid list or the yes, ability uh-huh, for yep. them to mm-hmm. then do something. Yes, uh-huh, Maybe it's yeah. back to the potato yeah. starch scenario, but yeah, tell, that's tell right. me more so a little bit about that. What I'd like that. to do, so um, what we want to do is we want to create a forum where um, we'll use things like the Ken Lassison take avoid database that we talked about. And other things, like we'd like to be able to plug into other um, search engines to, you know, to be able to scour the world for more um, like scientific literature, maybe that's relevant to your, your condition or whatever. And, um, and you know, today, when you have something that you're trying to understand about yourself, if you're trying to be, behave like a personal scientist today, you have to be responsible for collecting your own data. You have to do some kind of analysis. A lot of people like go into Excel or something like that and track themselves. And then you'll go Google the name of the condition you're interested in, or you Google the microbe or whatever, and you'll do have to do all this research. What we'd like to do is to make a platform so that instead of you having to do all that extra Googling or the Excel spreadsheet over, you just upload the data to our site. And when you upload the data to our site, you're giving permission for other people to see your data as well. And we think there are a lot of people out there who would love to be able to share their own data in return for being able to explore you know, the other space of people who have similar kinds of data. And... As a result, then, um, we'll have things in like the take avoid list. Um, we'd like to have uh, some kind of a community forum where you can maybe contact other people. If you see that uh, I am one of the only people who has a very high level of this particular microbe, um, you know, what's different between me and you? And so you'll be able to contact the other person and say, you know, hey, can we compare notes? Like, what is special? Like, what is it that maybe we're doing right or wrong? And then people can exchange, uh, you know, tips like the potato starch uh, tip or... Um, uh, you know, potentially other other tips like you know maybe you want to try this particular you know supplement or try this particular treatment, and so we like to create that sort of a forum where people are encouraged to generate their own hypotheses about their health or their wellness or you know how they can improve their performance, make it so that they can easily uh, try out those hypotheses, and then tell other people about it when it happens when you find something. So. Prior to us getting the other day, you talked about a, I'll say, an artistic expression <laughs> of your own microbiome. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, okay, so I've got all this data, and uh, it's, you know, it goes over years, and it's um, you know lots of different microbes that are rising and falling. And I thought, well, what would happen if you converted that that rise and fall into sound? So I did a what's called a data sonification, just a very quick little hack to see um, what a couple years worth of the microbiome would sound like if I turned it into a, a 30 second um, sound bite. Okay, so here, like, okay, so let me play this like this. Okay, okay so now you hear that. Now, um, listen carefully because you'll notice that there are a couple of tones that seem to, um, like they go, they go uh, quickly in order and then they suddenly d- they disappear. And what I believe is going on is that there you're able to tell particular microbes that are rising and falling and they may correspond to particular things I'm doing because I'm doing lots of different experiments. So listen to this for careful count. So do you hear this kind of one sound in the background? It's kind of going da 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 kind of going up and down. You sort of hear that? Yeah. Maybe it's kind of hard to, hard to pick up, but um, there's meaning in that sound. And especially since these are daily uh, samples that are taken daily, uh, you probably could, if you study this a little more carefully, you might be able to understand different things about trends that might not be obvious otherwise. So. Anyway, it's kind of cool. It is cool. One of the key topics of this this podcast is really talking about longevity and yeah. living longer, living better. And so how do you think the microbiome yeah. and the um, research so I you're think doing? There's a, I think there's a lot to talk about there. Um, first of all, your microbiome changes quite a bit over, li- over your lifetime. And um, there have been a lot of studies that have been done on the infant microbiome, for example, where it shows that... Uh, um, like within the first six months of life, there's just constant changes happening. And some of the changes that happen apparently get set and they will stay with you for a long time. And this is why it's, you know, it's, you have to be really careful when you're giving, say, antibiotics to an infant because 
uh, you don't know what you're messing with in terms of which microbes should be there or that won't be there later on, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, it continues to change throughout life. Well, the same thing is happening. Uh, the same thing is true about um, older people. And there have been a lot of studies that have been done on the microbiomes of, say, um, uh, centenarians or um, other like long-lived people. And we find these fascinating differences, like real obvious differences in the microbiomes between people who are living well when they're older and those who are not. For example, the people who are doing well um, apparently have just a, a much greater diversity of microbes. Now, what diversity means and you know, whether it's, uh, you know, which kinds of microbes are good to have it be diverse or is a, tepa- is a separate issue, but does look like the people who are living well um, have something about them where um, they're able to draw upon a richer variety of the genetics uh, that come from having a lot of different microbes. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on that. One, one kind of interesting story about this is that, so I've compared myself to my father, and um, you know, who's obviously older than me, and I was intrigued to discover that um, I have a superset of his microbes. So here I am, you know, 20 or 30 years younger than he is. And uh, I have more different kinds of microbes. Now, what's interesting is that my father is from the Midwest. That's where I grew up and has stayed there, you know, his entire life. He you know, was born and raised and he spent his entire life in the Midwest. And yet, and whereas I have been all over the place, you know, I'm currently living in Seattle, but I've lived, you know, in other countries. I've lived in um, the East Coast, in in California, et cetera, et cetera. And so it appears that somehow by having this richer um, variety of microbes attack me from various different places I've lived, that I have a a more um, like a superset of his microbiome, which I think is very interesting. And so one of the implications I think for aging well is if there is a, um, uh, if there's an advantage to having a diverse microbiome as you get older, you'll want to find out ways now when you're younger to successfully harbor a richer variety of microbes. Um, So that's like, that's one actionable thing you'd want to do. Richard, maybe you could tell us a few things that are just very practical things that everybody can do to improve their overall microbiome. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll tell you an easy one. Um, Let me ask you, uh, when's the last time you went more than 24 hours without eating? It was last week. <laughs> okay. You're probably a busy guy that just doesn't have time to eat then, huh? Exactly. Um, well, if you ask most people, you'll find out a lot of people will say, I don't think I can remember ever going without eating for a day. And I don't think that's a good idea. I think it's important for your, um, for your health. For every so often, you should go without eating for a while. And the problem is that from a microbiome standpoint, the microbes get used to getting food regularly. And the ones that thrive best when they get food regularly will start taking over. But you don't want them to take over. You want other things to have a chance to. So the first tip that I give people is, if you can, go without eating for a day, maybe two days, maybe longer if you can. Um, And I've talked to people who say that that all by itself reset some kind of condition that they were not happy with. And um, that all by itself fixed things. How often do you do do intermittent fasting? Um, Well, it's interesting. Every religious tradition has a, um, has a uh, um, tradition of fasting. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that all religious traditions have figured that out. So if you're Jewish, you know, I highly recommend um, you know, follow the Jewish fasts on, on holy days. If you're Catholic, that's what Lent is for. Um, you know, other religions similarly, um, you know, um, um, Islam with Ramadan, you know, try, different, try those kinds of fasting. That's the easiest way to get into it. Can you imagine then microbiome travel packages in the future. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that'd be kind of, that's, that's, actually, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, and I found from my own experiments that um, when I do travel, there's a clear shift um, in the types of microbes that I have in me. Um, I did a uh, trip to China um, last summer where I tracked myself every day, and I noticed very obviously a new microbe that just showed up um, that I hadn't had before um, as a result of traveling in China. Now, is that a good microbe background? We don't know. Log into personalscience.com and compare yourself. And you know, if you've been to China, see if you've got it too. Um, that's one of the things that I'd like to be able to understand is that there are more people out there like that. Um, but generally speaking, the, I think the more you can do to harbor a wider variety of microbes is going to be good for you as you get older. A lot of people who listen are experimenting a lot of different ways. So we've obviously talked a lot about the microbiome. Are there other specific things that you're experimenting with now on yourself or other people that you're around with that you're excited about? Um, Yeah. So the one thing I will tell you that uh, I think is the coolest experiment and um, works the best is kefir. Are you familiar with kefir? I am. So it's a fermented drink. Fermented drink. It's a little bit like yogurt. Um, I like it better than yogurt because um, 
it's extremely easy to make. You you get one of these. It's called a kefir grain. It looks like a little piece of like cauliflower or something. You just drop it in a glass of milk, leave it on the counter overnight, and um, you take out the little grain and throw it in another glass of milk, and you drink the the first glass of milk is turned into kefir. Um, and by now, the, kefir is a drink that apparently orig- originated in the Middle East someplace a long time ago. Nobody knows exactly how, but it's always been associated with health. And if you you know look it up, you'll see all kinds of articles and books that talk about why kefir is this miracle you know drink or whatever. Um, it's a it's clearly a fermented drink. There's lots of microbes in it. And uh, when I've tested myself, it was the one thing that I've noticed that um, creates a significant change to my microbiome. I can just you can just watch it on the days that I've had kefir. You know, there's a clear difference in the type of microbes that I have, and I think it's a clear positive difference. If you won the lottery tomorrow, and money were no object, what kinds of treatments or therapies would you try? Well, okay, so. There's a difference between the ones that I would try on myself <laughs> and the ones that I'd like to see other people try. <laughs> and my attitude about licensing, so I'm a little bit more conservative when it comes to testing things on my body than a lot of the more serious biohackers. But um, uh, there are a lot of unknown relationships between different kinds of food and the microbiome. And so, for example, one that is well understood um, is that uh, a variety of plants seems to has, have a major difference. So um, this was just some new news that just came out of the American Gut Project um, this week. There is a significant difference between, the kinds of the, between people who eat, say, um, I think it was more than 30 different varieties of plants every month than those who eat less than that. And that's kind of that's weird because you think, well, eating vegetables is good. But these are people who eat not just you know spinach and cauliflower, but they eat like I don't know, 16 different kinds of all kinds of weird, weird plants, but they apparently have richer, more diverse microbiomes. And um, I'd like to experiment with that a lot more. So it'd be nice to be able to get a bunch of people together and try, um, try to see what you could do if uh, you had access to some, you know, a a very, very rich variety of um, vegetables. Um, Especially, for example, I'd like to see foraging. So the kinds of vegetables that you get that are completely in your own environment is there some way to be able to enrich in your microbiome by having the kinds of um, vegetables that just grow naturally in the woods around here? Richard, thanks so much for joining us today. Where can people find more about you individually, uh, the Personal Science Guide, mm-hmm. and other things to learn more about this topic? So uh, I encourage you to go to personalscience.com, um, and we have a lot of information there, um, both about the experiments that I've done and, and a lot of ways that you can get involved. Um, if you want to follow me um, on Twitter, uh, I usually post something about, you know, every day or two, something I think relevant about the microbiome. And so um, please follow me at Sprague, my last name, S-P-R-A-G-U-E on Twitter. Great. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to another episode of How to Live to 200. Thank you so much for joining me and exploring this world together. I get a ton of help from the L200 crew that includes Lauren Krajinski, Sam Matera, Troy Strandquist, and Kevin Kirkpatrick. The theme music is composed by Emmett McCann. Yes, that's my nephew. You can learn more about this and other episodes at our website, livingto200.com, or find us on Twitter or Instagram at How to Live to 200 where we post lots of photos of cool things. It's early days for this podcast, so we would appreciate any and all comments or telling a friend or two about what we're doing over here. It might be irresponsible for you to keep it a secret. Until next time, eat right, get lots of sleep, keep good numbers, and be looking around the corner for the next big breakthrough. If we're going to live a long time, we better do it well.